Hey folks, Phil Zito here. I just wanted to take a second to talk to you about my new course, How to Evaluate a Building Automation System. In this audio course, you're going to have a series of 10 recordings that cover 10 criteria that are critically important for you to consider when you're looking at building automation systems. Now, who is this course for? Anyone who has to evaluate, design, install, or support building automation systems will learn from this course. But rather than going and taking my word for it, I wanted to give you access to the first recording for free. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the first recording of the How to Evaluate a Building Automation System audio course. Criteria 1. Openness. Ask any 10 people what openness means to them and you're likely to get 10 different answers. So what does openness mean? That, my friends, is the million dollar question. As best I can tell, openness tends to break out into one of four buckets. And those buckets are open procurement, open protocol, an open application programming interface or API, and open programming software. It's important to determine when folks say they are looking for an open system or when you are being told that a system is open, what kind of openness does that system really have or does that person require? The first form of openness that I'm going to discuss is the term open procurement. Now, what is open procurement? Open procurement is all the rage lately. And it's the concept that you should be able to buy any product from anyone at any time. Now, I know that's taking the example to the extreme. However, if you're truly talking openly procured products, you're stating that a product can be bought through a 1-800 number by anyone without any questions. Now, there's pros and cons to having something that is this available to the market. Let's first talk through the pros and then we'll talk through the cons. The pros of having products that are completely open to the market is that you'll have multiple suppliers in case you're not satisfied with the service you're receiving. In addition to that, you have the benefits of cost and competitive pressure from the marketplace to drive the solutions that you're provided, the proposals that you're provided to be the best price and best value that they can be. In addition, if you are a group that self-executes, meaning that you perform your own work, you have multiple places from which to source your controllers, meaning that you will be able to go and purchase controllers that you can stock and then from that stock, you're able to install and service your own controllers, your own supervisory devices, your own sensors, the list goes on and on. And finally, when you're dealing with an open program or an open platform that is openly procured, and yes, I know I used open a lot in that previous sentence, you're then able to tap on a wider pool of talent. Now, what does that mean, a wider pool of talent? Well, think about it this way. If ABC Company is providing their product and you can only buy their product from them and you can only work on their product if you've been to their classes and if you have their software, then naturally there's going to be a smaller pool of talent for that controls product versus if you have a product that can be purchased, installed, and serviced by multiple different organizations or service contractors, then what's going to happen is naturally you're going to see that there is a wider pool of talent. There's more folks you can hire who are experienced on that platform. Now, with every positive, there tends to be a negative, and that is the case with open procurement. One of the negatives of open procurement is that when you utilize multiple suppliers to go and provide a building automation solution for you, then what's going to happen is if that building automation solution is installed outside of that supplier's geographic scope, you'll tend to lose the consistency of standards of installing that you may want implemented if you're a multi-region organization. Now, what does that mean in layman's terms? Let's say you have 
a set of buildings. You have been following my building automation standardization guide, and you have come up with a standard naming, point, trend, alarm, graphics, the whole kit and caboodle. You've created a whole standard around your building automation system. And you have this one supplier that has been implementing this standard flawlessly. Even if you go and provide this exact same standard to another contractor, I guarantee you it will still look a little different. And here's why. Let's say that you have standard graphics. You even have standard stencil libraries. You even have standard snapshots. The point is, is that it never fails. Someone during the installation process is going to map a point differently, is going to name something differently, is going to set up how the graphics are aliased differently. And unless you're riding herd over this, it's going to happen. It's going to sneak in there and little by little, you're going to lose that consistency. Now, I don't mean to be fear mongering. I'm not trying to put fear in you and say that an openly procured product is bad. I don't have a dog in this fight. Rather, just want you to realize that there is some effort around this. It's not a panacea to go and just purchase something that's open, throw it along with a standard to a bunch of different contractors and say, have at it, boys. Good luck. No, what you have to do, what you need to make sure you do is that you oversee this process. And a lot of folks will say, Phil, that will never happen in my building. I'll enforce my standard until the chiller fails, until you get a power bump and all of a sudden the tuning in your controllers is gone. And then you have other things to focus on. And little by little, these things sneak in. I mean, I've been to Fortune 100 companies that have 50,000 unacknowledged alarms. And if they can't manage the alarms, how are they going to manage standardization across multiple projects? So you've got to be real with yourself. If you're going to accept the pros of an open procurement approach, then you have to be willing to accept the cons of an open procurement approach. Which brings us to the next form of openness. While open procurement seems to be the term that most folks are associating openness with today, it wasn't always the case. Back when I started my career, when folks were saying they wanted an open system, what they were really saying was they wanted open protocols. You have to understand, not very long ago, actually just a couple years ago, it was still rather hard to find a system that had a consistent open protocol that could be implemented across an enterprise. And what do I mean by that? Let's say you had ABC system and XYZ system, and I'm, I'm not naming names just out of respect for the system manufacturers. So let's say you have a BACnet 20 version system and a BACnet 10 version system. If you were to try to go and integrate those two systems together, that BACnet version 20 system may not be able to seamlessly integrate into a BACnet version 10 system because the BACnet version 10 system may not support the same points that are now existing in the later BACnet version 20 system. Now, what does all that mean? That's a lot of numbers and words. Let's really pull it down. Let's take it down to its most basic level. A protocol is the rules for how a system will speak. If I were to say to you, I want to go to the pool, and you're an English speaker, you would naturally understand that I want to go to the pool means I want to go to the pool. However, if I were to say pool, I want go, you might be able to understand that I'm trying to say I want to go to the pool, but you feel like, wow, this guy really needs to go back to English class because he has no idea how to speak English. Well, a protocol is the syntax rules for how a system will speak. When folks are saying they want open systems, sometimes what they're saying is they want systems that can talk to each other natively. And in the building automation space, up until recently, the way this was done was through open protocols. Now, what are open protocols? They are protocols where that syntax is openly exposed so that other organizations can develop systems that communicate using that protocol. In the past, in the past 10, 15 years, we've shifted from largely proprietary protocols 
where the manufacturers were the only ones who knew the rules and the quote unquote code of the protocol and would release it only to certain individuals. Now with the advent of Lawn, with the advent of Modbus, Backnet, etc., you now have open protocols which allow you to speak openly to other buildings and allow manufacturers to develop systems that are certified to speak these protocols. Now, another form of openness that has really come about lately is called the Open API or Open Application Programming Interface. Now, with the advent of internet-based systems, we've seen a rise in building automation systems that are supporting native application programming interfaces. With these application programming interfaces, they are providing software development kits. Now, if you're like, what the heck is all this gobbledygook mean? Let's break it down. So an application programming interface tells you how you can access the capabilities of a specific application and how you can interface to that application's programming. Hence the name application programming interface. Now, what does this look like? Well, what this looks like is a series of points and a series of functions that you can access. Sometimes these functions are called methods. And these methods allow you to perform certain tasks. So for example, if you wanted to read a point from another building automation system using its application programming interface, you would call the method read point or read property. If you wanted to write to a point using the application programming interface, you would call a method called write point or write property. Now, oftentimes when you're using an application programming interface, you will also receive a software development kit. That software development kit contains some sample programs as well as documentation around the application programming interface to help you go and create interfaces between your application and another application. Now, what would this look like in real life? What this would look like is a building automation system with an application programming interface communicating to another building automation systems application programming interface with some sort of software in between. Now that software would either be a gateway developed by a company like Field Server or developed by a company like DGBox. And the only reason I'm naming those companies are because those aren't direct competitors to the building automation space. Those are more gateway technologies. Well, you would create a software gateway that would allow these two systems to speak to one another. The final form of openness is what is called open programming software. I'm presenting these in the way that I see customers and I see fellow contractors understanding openness in the market right now. So the primary way folks understand openness is open procurement, followed by an open protocol system, followed by open APIs, and then finally open development or open programming software. And what is that? Well, at the end of the day, folks want to self-execute, but what they want to really do is they want to have access to the programming tools. And quite often, programming tools are either limited to the actual contractor who installed the software, or they are limited in that the vendor will only provide the customer a software tool with limited functionality. So when you're saying open software, what you're actually asking for is full functionality software, software with the full functionality, the exact same functionality that the person configuring the system would utilize. So what you want to understand here is that when you hear open programming software or open software or open programming tools, what folks are often asking for is that they want full functionality tools that they can utilize to configure their systems. So what do you do with this knowledge? What are you able to do? Well, first off, you are now able to evaluate what openness means. 
you're able to either pin yourself down if you're the customer or pin your customer down and have them explain to you what they really mean by openness. And once they have clarified or once you have clarified what form of openness you're after, then you're able to go and address the pros and cons with each form of openness, understanding that your ultimate goal is to achieve a solution that brings the greatest value to the customer. What I do not want you to take out of this is using this information to manipulate a customer to purchase a system that they do not need. I want you to take out of this information what the pros and cons are for each of these aspects of openness and then understanding how you can communicate those pros and cons now that I've explained them to you to the customer so that they can make an informed decision on how important each one of these capabilities is to them. So in summary, there are four forms of openness, the first of which being open procurement, which is the ability to purchase a offering from multiple sources. The second is open protocol, which is the ability for a building automation system to communicate to another system using an open form of communication. The third is an open application programming interface, which is a way for building automation applications to communicate and expose their methods and points that are available for other building automation systems to integrate with. And finally, open programming software and or open full access, full capability development software for the customer or for the contractor to use to further service the building automation system. In our next criteria, we are going to be discussing the topic of graphics. We are going to discuss what graphics are, how you evaluate graphics, and how you can look at graphics capabilities and determine what is important for either your customer or yourself if you are indeed the customer.